Many thanks for this great invitation to give a plenary lecture. As you've heard, I'm going to be talking about new antibiotics. I would first like to uh, show my uh, disclosures. And you can see um, those listed there. So one of the real innovations that we have had in new antibiotic development has been the development of new beta-lactams or new beta-lactamase inhibitors. The reason this has occurred is that, unfortunately, the world of beta-lactamases has got extremely complicated. We've now got, for example, carbapenemases, which have made life very difficult because of their uh, ability to hydrolyze carbapenems, which were previously the most stable class of antibiotics to beta-lactamases. So if we were to have an ideal beta-lactam plus beta-lactamase inhibitor, the beta-lactam in my mind should be one that's safe and well-trusted. The beta-lactam backbone itself should have excellent anti-pseudomonal activity. And the beta-lactamase inhibitor would cover all of the common beta-lactamase types. So ESBLs, AMP-C, and then a variety of different carbapenemases. KPC, the oxotype, metalloenzymes, for example, NDM. And I'm also going to add in there that I think the ideal combination would actually lack anti-anaerobic activity. Now, why do I say that? Because unfortunately, the broader our spectrum of antibiotics, the greater the effect, for example, on the gut microbiome. And therefore, if our combination does not upset bacteroides or other anaerobes, we might actually have a, uh, a more beneficial ecologic effect while still maximizing our anti-infective activity. So are all of these new beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors exactly the same? Now, of course, the answer is they are not. So I'm going to uh, go through keftazidine avibactam and then keftolazine tazobactam. So looking back at the uh, parameters for what would be an ideal uh, beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combination, well, keftazidine is a safe and well-trusted beta-lactam. It has excellent anti-pseudomonal activity and adding in avibactam will inhibit ESBLs. It will inhibit AMP-C. It will inhibit KPC-type carbapenemases and OXA48, but unfortunately will not inhibit metalloenzymes. The combination actually lacks anti-anaerobic activity, so would need the addition of metronidazole if it was, for example, to be used uh, in a mixed infection where we may suspect bacteroides. So one issue is, could it be used as a carbapenem sparing option for ESBL and AMPC producing organisms? So my colleagues and I have looked at this and looked at a variety of uh, different studies, particularly those in which keftazidine avibactam was compared with a carbapenem. And you can see, looking at this plot, if you go down to the, um, the different overall parameters, that clinical response does not appear to be worse than a carbapenem, uh, although the, there is a, a skew, I guess, uh, favouring carbapenems for AMC producers, although the numbers are very small, and potentially for keftazidine non-susceptible enterobacteriales, there is a, a potential advantage. Again, numbers small, no specific head-to-head -head studies for this purpose, but of, uh, of a potential advantage for keftazidine avibactam. Now, when we concluded, having looked at these studies, 
these studies were predominantly done in complicated UTI and complicated intra-abdominal infection. So we don't have uh, a lot of data yet on bloodstream infection or ventilator-associated pneumonia. We don't yet know the comparative collateral damage caused by keftazidine avibactam versus that uh, for carbapenems. So it may be a carbapenem sparer, but we don't yet have data on the more serious infection types in that regard. Now, how about if we do have a KPC producer and we were to have an option of keftazidine avibactam or the option of colistin? This is observational data from the US. It's presented not really in a very conventional way, but it is quite an illustrative way. You can see the black shading is the in-hospital deaths. The light gray shading is the proportion of patients who were actually discharged home. Box A is the patients treated with keftazidine avibactam. Box B, those treated with colistin. And you can see that far more died and were less likely to be discharged home in the colistin group compared to in the uh, keftazidine avibactam group. Now, how about keftolazine tazobactam? Well, do we have a lot of experience with this particular beta-lactam? Well, there's an increasing knowledge base of keftolazine. What we do know about keftolazine is that it has a high affinity to the penicillin binding proteins of pseudomonas. So it does actually have excellent anti-pseudomonal activity. It will be able to inhibit ESBLs and AMPC producers, but does not inhibit the carbapenemases such as KPC, OXA48 or the metalloenzymes. And like the combination of keftazidine with avibactam, keftolazine with tazobactam, uh, doesn't have anti-anaerobic activity. If we were going to use it in a mixed infection, we would have to combine it with uh, metronidazole. So for ESBL producers, we've uh, looked at it again in uh, less serious infections like UTI and intra-abdominal infections. And in that situation, found it to be just as effective as a carbapenem. But so far, there is not substantial data on more serious infections uh, when we're looking specifically at ESBL producers. There has recently been the uh, submission and publication of a phase three study for ventilator-associated pneumonia and what's known as ventilated hospital-acquired pneumonia. And in that situation, Keftolazine tazobactam did uh, perform uh, as well as a carbapenem. So how would I sum up these new beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations? For keftazidine avibactam, I would particularly target KPC and also OXA producers, whereas keftolazine tazobactam, I would particularly target Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And both of them would be potential options uh, as carbapenem sparing options for ESBL producers. Well, let's change direction now and talk about another new antibiotic, sifiderocol, which is what's known as a sidero 4 cephalosporin. And it has that name because it acts like a sidero 4 in that it binds iron and goes through specific iron channels through the outer membrane, rapidly gets across the periplasmic space where it resists the effects of most beta-lactamases and then binds down to penicillin binding proteins. So it's known as the Trojan horse antibiotic because it goes into the cell as if it was containing iron, whereas in fact it contains a cephalosporin. 
So in vitro, it is probably the most active antibiotic across the spectrum of aerobic gram-negative bacilli. And you can see whether it's Enterobacteriaceae, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, or Xenotrophomonas, the vast majority of strains, although I have to emphasize not 100% of the strains, are uh, susceptible to cefiderocol. What randomized trials have been performed? It has been compared to a carbapenem for treatment of complicated urinary tract infection. And what was very interesting in this study is that for complicated UTI, it actually uh, was favored. It was actually superior compared to imipenem. Now, I do have to emphasize that there were very, very few carbapenem resistant organisms. And it may be more a function as to how the primary outcome of complicated UTI is measured. But the data, as uh, you can see there, certainly did favor cefiderocol. Now, it has also been compared with high dose three hour infusion of meropenem for treatment of nosocomial pneumonia. And in this situation, uh, it was equivalent to a carbapenem. It was not inferior to meropenem. And that included the range of organisms you'll see there, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, and Acinetobacter. I guess the most difficult to interpret trial has been what's called the CREDIBLE trial, where cefiderocol was compared to best available therapy for treatment of documented carbapenem-resistant organisms. It was an open-label study. Uh, it was descriptive rather than uh, with a specific hypothesis. It, was, it showed that clinical cure with cefiderocol was generally uh, just as good as best available therapy. However, what's got a lot of people scratching their heads was that mortality was higher. And it was particularly in patients with acinetobacter infections. So the uh, place of cefiderocol is not yet completely determined, uh, particularly for acinetobacter although the results were quite good for metallo uh, beta lactamase producing organisms. There has been some uh, observational series with Acinetobacter, Stenotrophomonas, NDM producers with uh, really quite reasonable clinical success and survival rates. Uh, but at this stage, it is approved in the US for complicated UTI and nosocomial pneumonia. It's approved in the UK and the EU for resistant pathogens, but it's not yet approved for commercial use in any Asian country. What I'd like to talk about now are some of the drugs that are not yet approved in any jurisdiction. And just as uh, a little bit of background, and this comes from a, a marvelous website, uh, which is put together by the Pew Charitable Trusts. If an infectious diseases drug gets into phase one studies, there's a 20% chance of a drug being approved. If it gets into phase three studies, about 60% of antibiotics will end up being approved. Now, people say that the antibiotic pipeline is completely dry. Well, this is not really correct because in fact, there are 43 new antibiotics in phase one to phase three development. And I want to go through some of those now. So there are a number of uh, antibiotics which are in phase three development, which I list here, but which I'm not going to discuss. But I guess my top five I've listed here and all of the information I've gleaned is from the website of the relevant companies. Now, why have I chosen these? Because some of them have got activity against metalloenzymes like NDM, 
Some of them have got activity against carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter, whereas others are oral options for ESBL producers or oral options for gonorrhea. So Kefepim Tanibobactam. So this is a new beta-lactamase inhibitor, which is what we'd describe as a very broad spectrum beta-lactamase inhibitor. Now I say that because it inhibits ESBLs, AMC, KPC, they're all what we call serine type metalloenzymes, but it also inhibits some metalloenzymes like NDM and VIM. And so potentially it could be uh, useful uh, for CRE, carbapenem resistant pseudomonas, Burkhold area. And there's currently a large randomized trial uh, underway. What I'm really excited by is the fact that uh, this particular uh, antibiotic company that's developing this combination is developing it uh, with an organization called Guard P, the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership. And this particular um, uh, partnership allows the drug to be used in trials for neonatal sepsis, and also aims to distribute this combination on an affordable basis to most low and lower middle income countries. So I would think that potential comparators would be something like Keftazidi, maybe Bactam, with this combination having an edge in that it has metalloenzyme activity. It could also be compared potentially to sofidiracol. So let's wait for further data. One interesting combination, which has recently had type top line results released, is a combination specific for acinetobacter. So we've got sulbactam, which we know has got intrinsic activity against the PBPs, the penicillin binding proteins of Acinetobacter, and Derlobactam, which is an inhibitor of class A, C, and D beta-lactamases. Now, the class D beta-lactamases include the OXA-type beta-lactamases, which are frequently the cause of carbapenem resistance in Acinetobacter. So this is a specifically targeted combination for Acinetobacter. The recently uh, released results are from a study called the ATTACK study, and that is specifically for Acinetobacter pneumonia and bloodstream infection. It started enrolment in 2019. They used a, a BioFire film array pneumonia panel to enhance inclusions. And the results were released uh, only about two or three weeks ago. And the top line results are that 28 day mortality was not significantly different, but was numerically better for Derlobactam, Solbactam. Clinical cure was significantly improved over colistin, and nephrotoxicity was dramatically less with this combination compared to colistin. So at last we have the potential for a, uh, a drug, or in this case a drug combination, for colistin-resistant acinetobacter. Tebipenem is an orally administered carbapenem. And why is this potentially interesting? Of course, many of us have uh, issues when we have ESBL producers and we have to treat them when we've only got an intravenous carbapenem uh, as our only option. So this um, uh, oral carbapenem was evaluated for complicated UTI, an all oral regimen versus an all intravenous carbapenem regimen. And clinical cure rates were high, greater than 93% in both treatment groups. 
safety uh, was absolutely fine. And there were three C. difficile infections in the Urtapenem group, while none were observed in the Tebipenem group. Now, hopefully we'll see results of this study published quite soon. Sulopenem, I'm going to skip over because this was an interesting oral carbapenem, which seemed to be superior to ciprofloxacin when only ciprofloxacin resistant organisms were assessed, but was actually uh, not as good when quinolone susceptible organisms were assessed. So I don't think it's a great antibiotic. Jepotidacin is a completely novel antibiotic, orally administered, which is active against E. coli, but it doesn't really care what type of beta-lactamase is present. It's being studied versus nitrofurantoin in uncomplicated UTI, and is also being studied for gonorrhea. So our future world of oral UTI treatment could have oral carbapenems, oral jepatitisin, and oral cephalosporin beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations. I mentioned jepatitisin is also being trialled uh, for gonorrhea, as is another new antibiotic so called zoliflodicin, which is again a, a novel, completely novel antibiotic, and has had some success for gonorrhea. So what is the world going to look like in five years' time? I think we will have antibiotics active against NDM. We'll have sifidrocol. We may well have some of these broad-spectrum beta-lactamase inhibitors. Activity against carbapenem-resistant acinetobacter. While there are still question marks about sifidrocol, solbactam, derlobactam looks potentially very interesting. As I mentioned, also oral options for ESBL producers and for gonorrhea. So hopefully the world in terms of AMR will be a much more treatable place in just five years from now. Thank you very much.